So good afternoon. Thank you for coming or coming back to the session of the Envision, Invent, and Inspire. So this is a second part of the series of a presentation from uh, MIT Media Lab, Tanji Media Group. And uh, I talked about uh, vision-driven research, specifically Tanji Bits and Radical Thomas. So in this session, three PhD candidates, Daniel Reitinger, Lini Yao, and uh, Xiao Xiao are going to present their latest uh, project and also thoughts. Also in the last presentation of Xiao Xiao, she's going to perform the mirror fugue systems. So hope you will enjoy. And if any questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand in the end of the talk. So Daniel. Thank you. So uh, my talk is on uh, shaping the future of, of user interfaces. And uh, that's been the, the kind of pattern when I've been walking around the last uh, day and today, uh, usually people ask me, what do you do? And the second thing is, where do you come from? Obviously not American, I can't hide that fact. So I'll get the second one out of the way first. Uh, I'm from here, roughly, this is close to my house, uh, or uh, half an hour drive. But uh, it, it kind of looks like here, so I'm from Austria, and, and the thing in Austria that I know growing up uh, is, is this, uh, the world is not flat, so... <laughs> and people in Aspen, I think, can relate to that. Um, now the question is, so the, the world is not flat, and we as humans have gotten really, really good at dealing with this three-dimensional world around us. We're built to think spatially. Now the question is, what is flat? Uh, and and uh, when we look at graphical user interfaces, so the, the predominant uh, uh, form of interacting with computers is driven by pixels. Even right now, we're all staring at a, at a flat screen, essentially. And that's not changed since the 60s, uh, when the graphical user interface was invented. Now, we have a lot of new ways of interacting with computers through gestures, through multi-touch, but the output is still um, flat, hard uh, glass surfaces usually. So I really like this quote to describe it. Uh, eyes are in charge, but the hands are underemployed. Uh, whenever you interact, even with the newest devices, which we all love very much, you feel like something's missing. You don't have the richness of grasping something grasping real material. If, if any of you have ever tried pottery, I highly recommend uh, to all of you to try that. It's, it's amazing how good our hands are at that uh, after a little bit of training. And so our group, uh, for those who have seen my advisor's talk in the last session, um, our group is trying to challenge that. So we try to move away from this pixel-driven world of graphical user interfaces to embedding computation in the real world and real objects that we can grasp, touch, and, and manipulate. We call that tangible bits. So the idea is, if you imagine the digital uh, sea of computation, right now we have this place. We can kind of see this rich world underneath, but we can't really touch. We, th we like to think of tangible bits as this like iceberg kind of floating up, so now we have an intuitive handle that we can interact with. And let me give you an example to make that a little more concrete. This was kind of the project that drew me to the Tangible Group when I was an undergrad back in Austria. I saw this on the internet and I was amazed. Uh, so the, the idea is this is an interface for architects. It's a sandbox, you're a landscape architect and you want to design a beautiful landscape, say a campus. Uh, now instead of using your mouse and, and push around uh, vertices on a computer screen, you actually model that uh, landscape with your hands, with real materials, the computer automatically generates a three-dimensional model, runs a simulation on that. For instance, says, what happens if it rains for a day? And projects back that simulation right onto the material. So it really feels like you have tangible bits. You, you use real materials, the material matters. Clay produces different results than sand. And uh, so we have this very intuitive handle. So when I came to the group, um, this is not my project, so I was like thinking of what can I contribute to that? And if you look at it a little closer, there's one thing that we notice. The computer is very good at picking up uh, the information, scanning the model, good at outputting the pixels, like projecting onto it, but the computer's bad at is actually manipulating the material itself. So 
we can't really save this model and then save it to, uh, uh, like, uh, send it to a, to a uh, collaborator who can open it, or we can't, like, zoom into that model. So I was very interested in how can we make materials that we can program. And uh, there's, there's many different ways of, of programming materials. So the idea is, could we make a, a material that is smart, that can pick up what we do with it, kind of like clay, but smarter than that, and uh, where we can control material pro properties pro programmatically. So we can control, for instance, shape, density, conductivity, temperature, or the optical properties. So my first project was about shape. Um, I built this table, and uh, it's, it's a, a three-dimensional display, essentially. We use an array of actuators built into the table surface, and that forms, deforms the screen on top of it. So here we see a physical version of Google Earth. This is somewhere in the French Alps. And we have the Alps right in front of us. So now we, we have the shape. We can touch that shape. We can stand around it and discuss it, not all staring at the same screen, but actually seeing the object in front of us. And we can also always feel it and deform it. Uh, so, so really uh, interact with it, kind of like with clay, very low resolution version of it. But um, that kind of inspired my, my uh, collaborators, Tony, Matt, and David, to then build a version where they say, let's push it a little further and let's think about computational design in the real world, have actions where we can deform objects, but also use our gestures for um, larger programmatical control. So here, you can, you can use uh, your hands to like, form these invisible strings, pull out material, manipulate it, like move it around, and also always deform it with your hands. So our vision is, if we have a high resolution version of this, we could really like go in and, and shape something very clay-like, feel how the material responds to it, but always have like this computational control over it. We can save it, we can zoom in, we can, we can move around that material. Uh, and that, that brought us to uh, building a newer version of it, there were a lot of things we wanted to try out that this resolution wouldn't allow. So this is kind of the current prototype uh, using 30 by 30 of these actuators. And here we were very interested in uh, not only how can we show three-dimensional models, but how can we have a dialogue, a physical dialogue between the user interface and the person. So now if I put down that red ball, it will form, deform the shape to show me, to guide me where I can go with that. It can also push back and actually um, independently manipulate the position of the objects on the table. So instead of only a visually rich information, we now have information that we, that we feel uh, comes alive and is kind of not only interacting with us, but also with objects um, and, and pushing back to us. So we were thinking a lot of uh, this idea of like, how, how could we move from having a device in our environment to actually having an environment that can const constantly reconfigure uh, tables that, that shift uh, their shape in order to, to uh, facilitate more intuitive computation. Now the problem with that, of course, is uh, that the hardware for it is very complex. Uh, here, for instance, we're using 900 motors to form a still very low resolution version. And of course, we can envision that in the future, that's going to be uh, no problem because you know, we're, we're all uh, smart uh, uh, material scientists and mechanical engineers that, that will uh, be able to overcome these challenges. But we were also interested in, in the short term. Is there, is there simpler things that we can control? So one thing we looked at uh, was controlling the shape, the overall shape of, of the interface is very tough if we want to do it precisely. Maybe we can do something like control the density of a material and do that with a very simple method. So uh, we looked at programmable material density. We wanted to have a material that, again, is kind of like clay. It feels how we deform it, but we can also control uh, how it physically feels. So we can have a material that at some point is as hard as a, as a rock to a malleable, like clay, to, to something that is as, as liquid as a bag filled with water. And uh, together with the mechanical engineering department, we found this, uh, this method that is very popular now in robotics. Uh, and most of you know it, you just don't know the name for it. Uh, it's essentially, when you buy a bag filled with coffee grounds in the, in the store, 
you'll probably notice that it's very hard, and then as, you, as soon as you pinch a hole, it kind of turns very soft. Uh, and that's because the internal pressure of that bag um, is lower than the ambient pressure. There's a vacuum, so the particles inside jam together. And as soon as we change that, that pressure, uh, they, they behave like a fluid system. You can model that, and you can control that computationally if you attach uh, an air pump. So we were really interested in not only using that for robotics, but actually envision future computer interfaces uh, with that. And um, so we built some sensing um, mechanisms for it. And here's, for instance, an example that's, that's kind of like Sandscape, the project that I showed you earlier, where you can uh, deform the material using your hands to form a three-dimensional model. So on the screen up there, you see the three-dimensional model that is, that is being uh, pushed around and deformed. And here you see uh, me actually pushing into that material. What you don't see in this video is that that material is constantly changing, and I can feel that change. So as I, as I start out um, modifying this model, I start with a very soft model, kind of roughly push it around. And then as I get more detailed, I will adjust the stiffness to, to turn more into something clay-like until I can finally like, uh, solidify that model, essentially, to, to prevent further changes. And that's happening physically. Um, another very, very simple example is we, we built this little uh, tabletop puck that you can move around on this, on this tabletop display. And uh, depending on, on where you are, uh, the stiffness of it will change. So you can press into it, and if you're a doctor, for instance, you have this x-ray in front of you, and you actually have an, a haptic channel added to that. So not only do you see the, the x-ray, but you can actually, actually feel how the density of the, of the underlying bones uh, differs by, by actually touching them. Uh, and we were also thinking of um, how could a mobile, future mobile device uh, change? And so here we were envisioning, instead of like, say your, your Android or iPhone, uh, you actually have this bag. Um, it's soft when you drop it or you throw it in your backpack, but then when you want to use it as a phone, it turns stiff. And then when you want to turn it into a tablet, you turn it soft again and you kind of stretch it out. <laughs> and so now you have like this larger surface to interact with. It turns stiff again, so you can, you can use it. Uh, here, for instance, now we want to turn it into a game controller, so we, we mold it to our hand. And then, and then turn it stiff again. Um, this is research. That the hands that you see are, are my collaborator, Alex. This was done together with Alex, Nadia, and Sean, uh, my, my great friends and collaborators at MIT. Um, here, uh, we're stretching them out to, to like have this wand. Uh, or in the end, uh, there's a scenario where uh, we're actually turning it into a kind of wristband, watch-like, and it turns stiff again to kind of hold on to your ankle, and you move it away. So we, we really think, so there, there's different ways you can use these, these programmable materials. Uh, but, but the vision that, that drives this for us, and, and those of you who have been, been here in the last uh, session have seen this slide already, is the idea that we obviously want to move away from a world where we kind of feel disconnected uh, from the content that we manipulate with and from the people that we, that we interact with um, through computers. Now, tangible user interfaces are very, very good as an intuitive handle for that. But we think we will eventually move to a world where we have programmable materials around us. And so we won't think about interacting with a computer anymore. We'll actually be surrounded by, by dynamic materials that represent information. And that, and that kind of brings me back to uh, my first slide. Uh, obviously, the world's not flat. but. What I think is, is more interesting and doesn't show up in this, in this photograph here is the world is not static either. If, you, if, you look, if we zoom in onto this um, photograph, we actually see there is, there's, all of this is dynamic. Uh, the, the mountains on a very different time, time range, the trees on, on one uh, where they go over the season, and, and on, a, on a micro level, we, we have constant change. And that is programmed change. I mean, we, we have uh, DNA in all of these materials, uh, or in, in most of them, <laughs> anyways, uh, to actually drive, drive that change. And we think that uh, computers eventually uh, will get there, uh, inspired by, by nature. So that's our main driving force. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Daniel. I think I uh, informed all the 1,000 pins moving uh, red materials is quite uh, interesting because all the animated uh, materials, objects, reminds about agency. Do you have any thoughts or comments? Uh, yeah, I think that with agency it's interesting because uh, when, so a lot of, for, for those in the room who are HCI researchers, uh, the, the concept of affordances is very important. Uh, and when Gibson first defined affordances, he wasn't talking about computer interfaces. He was talking about us as, as animals living in the environment. And so when, whenever we encounter any object or any uh, other agent in the environment, we kind of think of what can we do with it and what does it want to do to us? So is it like, is it friendly? Is it dangerous? Can I use it? Should I run? And, and <laughs> I think that uh, when, when computers start uh, moving and, and start interacting with us physically, not only through pixels, uh, we'll encounter very, very similar questions uh, constantly of like, what does it want to do with it? And that's kind of an interesting tension. It's a very open, uh, open question and open answer. But Great. I think it's exciting. Great. So thank you, Daniel. So now I'd like to introduce uh, Lini Yao. She's, thank you, Daniel. Okay. Here is where I was born and grew up. It's Inner Mongolia in China, and it's a really peaceful, green and beautiful place. I really enjoyed it. And then, three years ago, I came for MIT to the U.S. Um, and this was the city where my plane first landed. I was shocked by the information around me. There, there was so much big cloud, crowd and there are so many buildings and displays. Soon after I got to MIT, I realized both in and outside of MIT, there are so many smartest people on this planet trying to add even more information to the real world. They are trying to put information on mobile phones on displays and even on glasses nowadays. And I started to wonder, well, instead of adding more information to the reality, could you try to maybe subtract some information at some point? <laughs> maybe by cleaning up all the noises, you can pay better attention to the thing you really care about, uh, which, well, this is what they do. And this is what I try to claim, diminished reality. And Together with Anthony DiVincenzi, we started to apply this idea to a video conferencing system. We built a smart system that can actively track all these participants and relevant objects in the physical environment. For example, the flip chart or the whiteboard. And we started to basically divide the physical spaces into layers. Some layers are the important ones and some layers are not. Um, this is what we came out. It's a video conferencing system called Focal Space. And basically in this space, we try to focus on the most important information. For example, whenever a speaker starts to talk, we will focus on that speaker and then blur all the background. Uh, we use the blur and focus effects because it turns out to be the most natural one. Um, we are familiar with that from Hollywood movies and also photographers use these focus and blur effects for, for nice portrait photos. And here we could see Tony was augmented and focused on the foreground with even his name and talking time um, just floating around him. Not only that, we could also track important artifacts on the foreground. In this case, when you start to draw something, you don't really need to rotate your canvas, showing it to the camera instead to let the other side to see it. Um, you can just simply have this augmented viewport for the remote participants. And of course, the, uh, for, from the remote side, people could also start to participate on the same drawings synchronously. Either use your computer or use your iPad screen. 
and also the system tracks the environment and movements of the human body. For example, if I move to the flip chart, a higher resolution image of the flip chart will be captured automatically and shown to the remote side. So we encourage really you move around with the, within the physical environment and starts to show any corner or anything in that space to your remote side. We play with different kinds of visual effects, but as I mentioned earlier, people prefer the focus and um, the blur effects the most. And we also start to apply the idea of diminished reality to all kinds of the situations in real life. For example, driving. When you're driving a rainy day, maybe you want to diminish the rain so you could see a, a better road condition. Or maybe you want to diminish the front view um, uh, in front of you and try to put a vertical map. Then you can just drive down intuitively. And maybe you could start to diminish the traffic in front of you and really find your friends and start to tweet or chat with them because everyone is free. Um, and also when you watch a sports game, maybe you can try to diminish something you don't want and really pay attention to the speaker you like, uh, sorry, the player you like or the most active speak, uh, player at that moment. And you can even grab that person to your personal services and uh, get into more detailed information. Well, all the series of projects are really um, my effort trying to go closer to the spirit of nature, which is simplicity. But you, if you look at all the projects, we are, what we do is really trying to create this visual perception for people to see the real world. But on the other hand, perception is fake. But if you look at the nature, nature never cheat. Um, when I was a kid, I used to run into the forest every time after rain because the, the air is fresher, I can smell the sun, and I can touch the leaves and even feel the soil under my, uh, under my feet. Really, it's a multi-sensory experience which exists in the real environment. Uh, so together with David, Constanza, and Alan Tsai, I try to push a little bit forward uh, from the virtual perception to the fabrication by nature. Back to the story of the forest, one thing I liked to do uh, was actually to pick up the mushrooms because they grow faster after rain. And I was always amazed by the beautiful shapes of the mushrooms. And if you look at closely, the cap of the mushroom actually includes two parts, the, the gill system and also the thin membrane on top of the gills. Um, and the rigidity, transparency and shapes of the membrane is always decided by how gills grow we started to draw out all the possible ways that we could design gill system and really put them on top of a, a stretched fabric. Let it dry for a day and then you release the fabric. It really form a 3D shape from a 2D flat piece, like uh, what mushroom does. And we go deeper, try to design all these more complex patterns of 2D gill system and really start to predict how the 3D shape will be formed and we went down into the machine shop, really stretched a bigger piece of fabric, hacked a, um, a, a, new, uh, a computer controlled machine to draw the 2D patterns on top of it. Waited for a day and something magical happened. This flat piece really just turned into this 3D shape as we expected, both in our mind and in our software. If we look at how the architecture, um, the buildings were built today, it's all about two processes. The process of constructing the inner supporting structure and the process of building the outer it, are separated. But in this case, instead of constructing a 3D surfaces, we are really trying to grow a 3D surface. Imagine maybe one day, instead of you putting on a piece of cloth, that just, just gonna be like a 2D flat fabric laying on your bed and suddenly transform into this 3D shape and put on you. Um, even more cra uh, crazy, crazier, you could start to imagine a flat piece just wrap around your feet as a shoe and turn into a fin when you jump into water. But could it be material so smart? Can they really be expressive, responsive, and so intelligent to interact with humans? Um, well, if you look at the nature, the natural materials actually talks. My dad used to design his own trellis system to train the grape vines grow. I grew up under those vines, so I definitely know 
they try to talk to the trellis system. And leaves talks to the wall, everyone knows. And trunks talks to each other by intertwining with each other. And there are smarter leaves try to talk to human touch by opening and closing itself. It can happen because within the cells, they try to absorb or lose water to change the pressure in order to deform. Well, it's really amazing because for this piece of leaf as a material, it doesn't actually use any active force like electricity, or it also doesn't consider, uh, contain any motor. It just uses these passive natural forces like air or like water. So can we design something similar to that? Um, together with also Yuma Inyama, GVO, and Sean Former, we started to imagine a material that without any motor, or anything else. You just literally give some air for it to breathe and touch it. It's going to start to respond to you um, in an interesting way, just like how, how the vines will do. Um, if you imagine the human skin actually behaves in a similar way, it can sense your touch for sure, and it also transforms itself by the deformation of the muscles. Here we show more examples of how we could achieve different kinds of deformations just through pumping air into it. Um, by combining different air bladders, you could achieve more complex or expressive shapes. And by designing the supporting structure, you can control the same piece to transform in different ways. And also you can design different textures on top of the single piece of materials. Here, a lamp rope starts to talk to you. When you just pull it down, it will bounce back and start to wrap its uh, own body and turn into an energy um, saving bulb shape and lights up. So you really see the physical artifact starts to talk to you. And also we insist, again, don't put any accessories or extra motors or sensors into it. In this case, we use injected liquid metal for sensing. So the liquid itself can sense the deformation and tells um, either we are pulling it or either it deforms itself. Also by carefully positioning the uh, the air bladders and also control the density of the air bladders, uh, control the programming capability of the air flow. flow, we could really start to deform a surface in a very interesting way. Here, a cell phone starts to communicate with you through its own motion. And once you pick it up, it stays in this phone shape with this natural metaphor of covering both your mouth and ears. After that, you can just simply put it on your arm, it wraps. Um, things just become alive. You, of course, can change a flexible surface into a rigid surface, so it's easy to uh, manipulate. In this uh, last documentation, we really want to show how we fabricate those type of smart materials. Um, as most of you may or may not know, most of the, the digital fabrication machines, for example, 3D printers, cannot really print stretchy materials, so we adapted soft lithography. It's a process most scientists use to fabricate uh, stretchy sensors, circuits, or actuators. In this case, we really designed this game controller to be the iPad case. Once you start your car driving game, the air, bigger air ba uh, bags coming out first, and also the texture starts to pop out sequentially, one by one, to indicate to you directions if you turn left or right. Really, we could imagine to put this piece of materials um, on top of maybe your steering wheel or, uh, or the back seat of your, 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 uh, your driving seat. Um, sorry, back of your driving seat. Uh, in that case, you don't listen to GPS, you actually feel the GPS. Well, um, when I was a kid, I used to play with ants a lot because I didn't have computers, although that was 20th century. Um, but really, I, I see sometimes they just worked really hard and trying to carry food back home. Whenever that happened, my grandma would run out and tell me to go home. And she would say, 
wow, see, ants tell you that a big rain gonna come, you should go back. I was so amazed by how intelligent the nature could be. Um, but at MIT, I can't just play with ants every day. Um, and also, I believe that the, the, the time past can never go back, so we have to uh, envision a future that's different from the past or today. What's the real future of, of computers? I believe in the future, computer will disappear. It will just be seamlessly, seamlessly integrated into the physical surfaces, environment, and also all the physical artifacts that you could encounter in your daily life. That's what I mean by a programmable nature. Thank you very much for allowing me to share my imagination about the future. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, your first picture of the Mongolia is very, very impressive because so much beautiful information. But in terms of the amount of the information, maybe it's more than the New York, but you didn't really feel overwhelmed. Do you have any comments about nature? Yeah, um, that's a very interesting point. I showed two different pictures in the beginning. Everyone would agree at, the, at, 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 the, at first that the New York actually embody more information, but which actually not true. Just as Daniel just mentioned, nature, although on the surface is static, but it's actually dynamic. There are so many things you can learn from it from different level. For example, nature can create beautiful forms. There are so many artists and designers trying to get inspiration for nature to design very beautiful parametric forms. Even in my small case of mushroom, I'm learning from it to design forms. And nature could also create create motions, of course, the mimosa leaves is one of the example. And nature create functions, for example, sponge. Um, it really absorb water in an in a interesting way, and some furs try to repel all the dust. Um, and also, if you think nature uses passive forces, as I said, air, water, those are all user-friendly. Why human beings are inventing so many gadgets, consuming electricities, and all these um, not user-friendly energies. That's all these questions I am trying to um, ask and also trying to get an answer for. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So now, this uh, last piece, uh, Xiao Xiao, she's going to talk about the art of huge and information. Xiao Xiao.
you. So about five years ago, um, I was practicing piano one day, and as I often do, I was looking at the reflection of the keyboard and of my hands on the fallboard, and I had this thought of, wouldn't it be really lovely if instead of seeing my own hands there in the reflection, I could see somebody else's hands, and that the piano could serve as a portal to someone else from far away or perhaps even from another time. So shortly after that, I started off as a graduate student at the MIT Media Lab in Hiroshi's group, Tangible Media, and I started going about trying to build this. So Yamaha kindly loaned me this piano over here, and so here I am uh, in my office with a grand piano crammed in. During the day, I'm programming on my computer, and at night, I turn around to practice on the piano. So my desk chair is actually the piano bench. Um, so despite the superficial similarity between typing on the computer keyboard and playing on the piano keyboard, the two are worlds apart in terms of interaction and in frame of mind. As an undergrad, I went to MIT for computer science, course six, and computer science is essentially the science of information systems that seeks to encode the world as information that the computer can represent, manipulate, and store. A core concept of computer science is this idea of abstraction. In other words, a way of describing the world symbolically, of categorizing, procedurizing, extracting the salient content over the details. So this idea of abstraction isn't just for computers, it's a really powerful way that human beings make sense of the world intellectually. So suppose I told you that this morning I woke up at uh, 5 a.m., came here to set up at 7, went to an amazing session at 9, I'm giving you an abstracted summary of my morning, skipping the vast sensory details of what had actually occurred. So at the end of the day, as human beings, we have to interact with the world and with our computers. And it is an interaction where keeping things as abstract information isn't the only way, nor is it always the best way. And that's because human beings experience the world through embodied experiences. Um, let me give you an example. So suppose you wanted to know about the weather. You can either pull out your fancy smartphone, open up your handy weather app, read the temperature from the screen and look at the icon for the sun to form an impression in your head of what it might be like. Or you could simply step outside like Li Ning always did when she was a child and feel the sun on your face and breathe in the crisp mountain air and immediately feel what it will be like. And so, of course, your smartphone in the digital world can give you information that going outside cannot, such as the temperature in another city or the exact percentage that it's going to rain for the next 12 hours, but going outside gives you a much richer, much more immediate experience. And if you're enough attuned to that experience, you always know exactly when rain is on its way. Um, so for the past few years at the Media Lab in the Tangible Media Group, I've been thinking about designing digital information, interactions with digital information to be more experiential. And to that, um, instead of looking to nature, I've looked to the way that human beings experience music. Um, and that's because music is actually this really abstract thing when you think about it. As sheet music, it's just symbols encoding information on a page, but we never really think about music as just abstract information. We, and the abstract nature of music does not limit it to just the intellectual mode, the intellectual analysis. And I'd like to think that the very sparsity stemming from the abstract nature of music enables us to better breathe life into it in a performance. Um, so how do you do that? Well, so here I put on my hat as a pianist to tell you that the key is not just what you play, but how you play it. For one, it's deeply rooted in the physical. You've got to develop a finely tuned ear, not just for the correct notes with the correct rhythms, but more importantly for things like tone and timing. And you've also got to develop the physical facilities, your muscular control, in order to play what you hear in your inner ear. But beyond that, there's the, the playing itself must embody physical qualities, like a sense of gravity, a sense of movement, singing lines, dancing beats that affirm a sense of being in the world. But then there's another component, the, the invisible. I, as the performer, must 
project my inner world, my imagination, my life experience, my emotions into what I play. And you as the audience must in turn project your inner world of imagination, life experience, and emotions into what you hear. So some of my favorite pieces to play are contrapuntal, like the fugues of Johann Sebastian Bach, pieces with multiple voices that intertwine and intersect. And to be rather honest with you, I came to these pieces um, intellectually. As a teenager, I would print out sheet music and obsessively highlight them, trying to analyze the intersection of the lines, the harmonies, the cadences. But while this piece uh, could be understood in this way, it is also this. Um, could I get the video, please? All right, so uh, this is an excerpt from the C minor partita of Johann Sebastian Bach, played by Glenn Gould. Not quite a few, but you get the idea. Um, as for me, it was years before I realized that while the intellectual mode cannot be ignored in music, it alone is not sufficient, for music must be in the body and felt from the heart. So indulge me for a second, my computer science side, and let's talk about music as interaction with information, though of course it's much, much more than that. So for almost the entirety of human existence, music could only be heard live, where it was intricately tied to the body of the performer. But with the invention of recording technology in the 19th century, we could now extract only the sound, taking a slice of the performance. And we could listen to it anywhere at any time with a pure sort of listening that focuses more on the content to the extent that Glenn Gould, whom you just heard, prophesized the demise of the live concert at the hands of the recording. But more than 50 years later, the live concert is still, well, alive and thriving. And I'd like to think that there is something really powerful about the performer being there. So my project, Mirror Fugue, named for a special type of fugue by Bach, tries to bring the presence of the performer back into the recording. So you might be thinking, OK, why don't you just watch a video? There's plenty on YouTube. It's way more convenient than all of this. And funnily enough, whenever we think about the digital world, we tend to only care about the convenient, the useful, the constantly available streams, no deluge of information flowing through our eyeballs into our brains. And we forget about the richness, the poetry, the beauty of the experience in the world. An experience often flawed and always fleeting, but sometimes it just takes your breath away. And I'm here to tell you that after the years and iterations from working on this piano, that there are times where you must look past just the convenience, the usefulness of the digital world. And if you're able to do that, you can even craft the most abstract information into visceral experiences which is ultimately what design is all about. But furthermore, if you can embed digital information firmly in the physical world, if you can engage multiple senses, create a feeling of space, and if you allow a bit of room for the imagination to fill in the blanks, something really magical happens where it's no longer perceived as separate streams of useful, convenient, available information, but as a coherent, present, visceral experience. So what can you do with this sort of experience? Um, well, on the piano, for one, you could listen to a concert from a famous pianist from across the world. So this is my teacher and mentor from Boston, Donald Fox. You could sit in front, have an intimate perspective, and even learn how to play, not just the notes of the hands, but also the breathing, the phrasing, and the characterization of the person. You could also play a duet with yourself like I did in the very beginning, but what I really like to think about is what if you can play a duet with yourself in the past? So, uh, can we switch back to the slides, please? Um, there we go. So this is Alisa, daughter of Hiroshi Ishii, my advisor, but let's just pretend for a second that I am her, 20 years later, all grown up. 
So、um, I can encounter myself at the piano. Sit down in front of her and even play along. So of course you're not limited to just playing with versions of yourself on this piano. You can play with anyone from any time, perhaps grandparents, even when they were at your age. So obviously this is not my grandfather on the piano right here, but some of you might know him as Marvin Minsky or the grandfather of artificial intelligence. What you may not know about Marvin is that he actually improvises on the piano contrapuntal pieces, often fugues. In a fugue, there are always multiple voices that interweave and intertwine. One may take the focus at different times, but the others are never ignored. I'd like to think of the fugue as a metaphor for music performance, for interaction, and also for life. So on one hand, you have the intellectual, the analytical side. On the other hand, you have the physical, the sensorial, and on a third hand, you have the inner world of emotions and imagination. And it is the intertwining of all three that deeply engages us and invites us in. So I'd like to invite you into one final performance on Mirafugue. The Aspen premiere of a piece arranged by my teacher Donal Fox, called Partita for Three Characters, which is a reimagination of the very first piece that you've heard, a prelude from the first Partita by Bach.、Um, in this piece, I'll be accompanied by Donal, whom you've heard earlier, and also my good friend and jazz pianist Nick Sanders. So, hope you enjoy. So, is it Q and A time, or is there time for the special encore performance? Because there is a special encore performance. <laughs>、um, 
So Hiroshi, are we inviting someone to the stage for it or? So, okay, I was actually thinking that for the encore, because the experience up here is actually quite different and much more special than from far away, even though I'm, it looks cool from far away too. So um, I, I was thinking of picking maybe one or two special members of the audience to come sit on stage for the encore. So first two people to ask good questions, go. <laughs> okay. Mark Davis, could that be done live? That was a recording, obviously. Yes, it was a recording now, but um, there's no reason why it can't be done live. It's just that um, I only have one grand piano in my office, not two, from which to feed into each other. Um, and I think in order to do it live, you'd have to deal with issues of latency, which I'm not an expert in, but I'm actually speaking with Cisco about doing possible collaboration. So perhaps in the future, coming to a living room near you. Yes. Do you find it distracting at all to be looking at uh, either yourself or the other pianist that you want to play? Right. So I think it depends on. Um, you raise a really interesting point for the experience of different people. So what I performed here, I think having the visuals there is mainly for people who are watching, so that you see the different people embodying the different lines of the music. Um, for playing there, no, it doesn't really bother me so much. Maybe it might bother other people. Um, I think that sometimes it also helps with like anticipation of what's going on, though of course if you're a musician you can also anticipate by listening to it. But I think it would be really helpful. So for me, the two um, applications that are the most um, I guess that I care about the most. One is when you're just sitting in front of it, looking into the reflection. Something happens where when you look at the upper body and your peripheral vision, your brain somehow tricks you into thinking that it's more three-dimensional than it actually is, and you start to believe that actually there's someone there, which has applications for looking at moments in the past, playing with, I don't know, your grandmother. Um, and then the other application is, of course, the learning scenario where you follow their hands, sure, but you can also learn rhythm, breathing, um, embodying different characters of different styles of music. Yeah? What are possible applications for this beyond the, the music? What, have you thought of other things that this could be used for beyond music? Actually, um, other things that have, done, have been done with something similar beyond music have been done 20 years ago by my advisor, Hiroshi. <laughs> The collaborators in front of you make a huge difference. Also, I'm a calligrapher. I use a brush. People appreciate the results of drawing, but not necessarily the process of gesture. So big difference listening to the iPod, but this one is how the process embodied interaction. Even before any sounds are made or any stroke on the paper, you see the how the process of the embodied interaction, that's really power to appreciate the art of the calligraphy and also the piano. So many arts really requires understanding of how the process and the breathing. So I think there's a tremendous spectrum of the application in future. Um, okay, yeah, so maybe if you know the people who ask questions want to come on stage and sit on the keys, um, while you come up, um, if you don't have to, of course, I'll tell you about the piece that will be played. So, um, do you guys know uh, Richie Sakamoto? Anybody? So, um, he's a Japanese pianist, um, very good pianist and also improviser. And he visited the Media Lab last week and I had the lucky chance of recording him on my piano. So, what you're, you guys are going to hear as an encore is an improvisation by uh, Richie Sakamoto. So, yeah. Please. Um, can we get the lights off, please? All right. So, please go ahead and sit.
show. The show. show. Yeah, oh. so. Uh... Daniel and Lini. So now I'd like to conclude uh, the two sessions in sequence. I talked about uh, defy gravity, how it's important to think about long term vision, vision driven research. But also, I talked about uh, coming up uh, really exciting visions. Arts is always an important engine. And I hope we communicated about how really arts, design, and also science and the engineers come together to create really exciting uh, medium for communication and expressions. So, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much.